All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Max. I have a big idea for you, um, and I hope you will take it as that. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Andrew Black. Um, please blame me for the crazy aspect of this. It's really not his fault. Um, so first off, uh, well, I'm going to be talking about sorting, but I have sort of a different take on it. Um, and I need to explain to you what a spatial computer is. This is not something that I came up with, but um, we have this definition here. A uh, spatial computer is um, a collection of uh, devices which are distributed through a physical space, um, such that the difficulty of moving information between these devices is proportional to their distance in the physical space. And then also um, the functional goals of this system, which we're going to consider as one single computer, although it's made up of sort of lots of little sequential computers, are defined in terms of that system's spatial <coughs> structure. So um, first observation that I want to point out is we don't really get to choose part one. Part one is sort of true of lots of things. Uh, it has to do with the speed of light. Um, it's not really negotiable, sort of, if we want to look at that level of detail. Part two is a little bit more hopeful. Um, part two sort of offers a, uh, a way forward. So uh, let's talk about hardware for a second. Um, there's lots, lots of these sort of, I call them tiled array type architectures, which have been built and designed uh, over, I don't know how far long, <laughs> Go, you know, going back. You know, here's the transputer uh, from the early 80s. I don't know if maybe you remember that. I was in diapers. Um, <laughs> But uh, I want to point out, these, these things are actually very similar in a way. They, they, they're these tiled arrays of sort of elements that do a certain small amount of computing and then push sort of data off to their neighbors. Uh, we have very fine-grained architectures over here where sort of an individual element is something like a, a logic gate. Um, we have very coarse-grained architectures comparatively, like the tile era, where each individual element is something like an x86 core plus a router. Um, and there's plenty of room in between. There's, there's lots of middle ground there. Um, so, in answering the question, right, uh, are these spatial computers? Kind of a trick question. Yes, they all have this, this sort of difficulty. Um, you know, you can't get from sort of one, one point in one of these grids to the far corner without incurring some costs that have to do with the distance between those two points. Are they spatial computers? Depends how we program them, right? So, so with that, um, sort of the, the thing that I want you to take away from this talk is that this thing, uh, spatial computing, sort of a, 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 you know, a new approach to computing, it gives us some insights into the costs and constraints of communication in sort of large, large parallel array systems. And I would argue is sort of is a limiting case. Everything's got to live in the physical world. So it's, if we're going to build computers with tens of thousands of cores, we're going to have to deal with this kind of stuff. Um, but better than that, it also sort of gives some insight in how to, how to design algorithms. Wouldn't you call a new one system also a spatial computer? Um, Even though physically it might be. It depends how you program it. I mean, if, you, if, if you're aware, you know, sort of if, you, if you're doing the right thing and you're aware of sort of the location of all of your, your program elements sort of in the physical computer, then yeah, you're programming it like a spatial computer. Um, but you don't have to do it that way. You can try to ignore it. Uh, I'm saying, let's not do that. Let's match the communication structure of the program to the physical structure of the, com of the spatial computer. It's kind of obvious, right? Well, I'm going to show you there's sort of a consistent way to do this. Um, and I'm going to use the example of a sorting algorithm because I think people understand sort of how sorting algorithms are supposed to behave. Uh, this one's a little bit different. Um, I'm imagining sorting uh, sort of as a physical process, something distributed through physical space. Um, I'm going to represent each data element by a particle. I'm going to represent sort of the value of that data by the color of the particle. Um, I represent sort of the sequence, um, which is what I care about sorting, by this sort of spatial position of all these uh, data elements. And every time um, so the particles are going to move around here, and every time they collide, that uh, corresponds to a comparison. So there's a very simple rule here that sort of explains how these comparison collisions work. Um, it's, uh, well, it, it depends on actually sort of, I am fudging just one tiny thing here, because the global, uh, this, this sequence, darker to lighter, that's the way I want things to end up in. But um, that sort of depends on, you know, knowing at every single point here where which is left and which is right. Luckily, that's sort of constant. So um, 
assuming that you know that that information is available at every point, uh, sort of physically in the system, collisions between particles which are sort of already in sorted order are elastic collisions. They bounce off of each other. particles bounce off of each other. Uh, collisions between particles which are not yet in sorted order means they pass right through each other, and uh, and so the whole thing sort of ends up looking like uh, like that. Oops, let's see it here. There we go. So that's kind of what the, 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 this is what one of these things looks like when it's running. So there's a couple more details that we need to add before we can sort of get to the, the point here. Um, so in sort of, that's the idea, right? That's the sort of abstract idea. Uh, there's going to be some work I need to do to actually make that match up with any kind of computer. So um, first, let's talk about time. Now, <laughs> to a physicist, you know, somebody who's perfectly OK with real numbers, um, you might maybe make an argument that no two things happen at exactly the same time. If you can just measure time fine enough. Well, here in computer science land, that's just not going to cut it. We need to quantize time somehow. So in quantizing time, um, it's po quite possible to have collisions sort of between multiple particles at once. And I want to be able to capture that. So instead of sort of doing collisions pairwise, which works, I say, well, let's be a little bit smarter. Let's actually detect every sort of complex collision and turn them into sort of collisions between a single particle and sort of this phantom particle, which is the average of all of its neighbors. So here, I'm actually applying the same rule. I'm just sort of, um, you know, here, this is, you know, this is B. That's in you know, that diagram. This is actually A and C divided by two. Um, so that's so much for time. Uh, let's talk about space. Um, well, I want to divide up the space, and that's sort of an obvious way to do that. I divide things into patches. Um, and I have sort of this loop, uh, which is running simultaneously in every patch. And I want, to, I want you to notice I've extended the analogy here a little bit more. Um, patches of space now correspond to processors. Motion between patches, I'm just going to talk about messages. Um, so something I'm doing here, which Sort of if I was making a you know computer graphics type uh, you know or a physical simulation would be bad practice. I'm not even bothering to detect collisions that happen across patches. I started doing you know with doing that and I found it's a lot of work. It, the payoff's not really worth it. it. Makes things more complicated. Let's just get rid of it. So this is uh, probably a little simpler than um, you know more sophisticated uh, particle collision detection algorithms you can find in the literature. And I, I want, really want to emphasize the point. Every single one of these processes here, which sort of correspond to these patches of space, is running exactly this loop. And it's consistent across the entire system. Um, so here's what it looks like if we were to sort of take that picture and unroll it into a space-time diagram. We've got time running down this, the, um, the vertical axis here. I'm going to look at a system with 100 particles starting in random order. Um, sort of distributed at random across the space. And they're all going to take little itsy bitsy steps of one tenth of a particle or sort of a patch width um, at each step. That is one sort of each, each time around that loop. So lo and behold, we let the thing run after about 150 steps. Every, all collisions are elastic. They're bouncing off of each other. We get sort of this rounding motion thing, but everything is in sorted order. All right, well, 360, that's kind of a lot for 100 particles. I should be able to do better than that. Let's just make them go faster. All right? So now I'll take nine tenths of a patch width in each step. And <coughs> sure enough, I mean, it's a little bit harder to read this diagram, but you can see sort of things are approximately sorted after, you know, right about here. But they don't get any better than approximate because there's, they're, they're taking too big of a step. They can't sort of do that fine-grained uh, um, comparisons. They actually are moving right past each other. They're jumping over each other. Um, and yeah, we get some approximation disordered, so. Um, well, ta-da, so there's sort of the obvious answer to this. Let's make the, uh, the collisions, uh, or sorry, let's make the, the velocities of the particles sort of post-collision um, dependent not just on sort of the sign of that comparison operation, but on the entire scale. Uh, so now we start them off at sort of a maximum speed of 9 tenths. They sort of cool down, if you will. And start moving slower, and uh, they'll eventually sort of stabilize. I, I got to say, this is an instance of a, something I've seen in chaos theory that those guys really know well about, hill climbing and decreasing distances and 
It shows up in scientific research, mm -hmm. biological evolution, and a lot of places. Thank you. That's a good point. This is an extremely chaotic system. It's a very nonlinear system in a sense that I'm sort of, there's a lot of, you know, deterministic or non-deterministic, there's a lot of chaotic behavior in this. But I'm actually getting it to work for me. That's nice, right? Um, well, here's something a little weird. That was 100 particles, right? Here's 200 particles, and look. Sort of the same amount of time. So, like, what am I doing? You know, there's got to be some sleight of hand here. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <laughs> well, actually, sort of even better. There's just more interactions going on in here. Uh, so, let's look at some sort of pathological cases that you would expect, you know, a, program, uh, a sorting program to be able to handle. How about reverse order? Yeah, we do reverse order. We've got sort of a delay here while we have some symmetry breaking. In this case, sort of not detecting particle collisions across a boundary is actually working for me. It uh, helps break the symmetry here. You can see the, the most extreme value from each particle in each patch, the patch of the gray strips. Um, they're the ones that escape first, and then they start sort of breaking up with the symmetry. And, and then we've got everything sorted after 30 seconds or so. Uh, Here's another one. Two subsequences, both in sorted order. Well, <laughs> if the particles didn't move, then they would just stay that way. But they do move. They're bouncing off of each other. And sure enough, you know, information propagates across, across the system in global sorted order. Uh, <laughs> so um, I hope everybody brought their, their 2D glasses, because I'm going to run an animation for you. Um, this algorithm that I've described sort of for a single axis, well, let's put two axes orthogonal to each other, and guess what? It's, uh, it's sort of um, they're linearly independent. We can run both sorts simultaneously. We can sort along two axes at the very same time. Like, watch this. Watch especially close at first, because I have to run the thing longer than it really takes, just so you can see it. They're all bouncing off of each other. You know, again, I, I don't know exactly which order sort of which spatial order they end up in, but their approximation to sort of sequential sorted order in both directions is close enough for, well, visual purposes anyway. Um, okay, so um, in analyzing this thing, I have to point out, you know, if we're going to talk about any kind of parallel algorithm that's distributed, uh, we need to talk about not only sort of local, local computation costs in terms of operations, um, but we really need to talk about communication costs. And here's where spatial computing sort of gives us something to talk about. So as a matter of fact, I, you know, I'm, let's just make things simple. Let's just assume that local computation is, is damn near free, you know, almost free. Um, and let's talk about the cost of communication between system components here. Well, let's <coughs> go down a little bit. Um, so in reasoning about this thing, I have to point out sort of the way I frame the problem and the way that these array viewers work. Um, if I have a particle that's sort of up here and it really needs to be down here, it's got to have to make a multi-hop sort of path. There's different possible paths, but you know, if we sort of assume the, um, the four neighborhood here where each square is only sort of connected to its four <coughs> cardinal neighbors, then there's going to be sort of four, four messages sent, regardless of how you get through there. So, But it doesn't have to be one time. No, it's true. Um, in fact, so that's a very good point. Um, it's quite possible. I mean, and in, in, in the end case, you know, you are going to get sort of particles bouncing back and forth against you. Um, but my point is, is just that it's not possible to sort of to move this thing from here to there in less than four steps. Um, so we take more, you can't take this. Yes. Um, so, I guess I should probably, yeah, you're right, this is, I can, <laughs> in practice, what I see is um, that uh, particles move across the system sort of very close to the minimum possible dis you know, distance in both you know, two dimensions, three dimensions. Um, and important point here, this is assuming that sort of um, the cost of a message send is actually sort of, you know, the cost of sending any any message sort of dwarfs the 
sort of additional cost of adding more particles into that message. So I'm talking about messages that convey sort of multiple particles at once in one step. Um, but tracking just the number of messages, um, I don't know, maybe somebody will tell me a, a better way to do this on this type of machine, but I, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't say minimum possible. Let's just say pretty good. All right, so what about component failure? That's another important thing to talk about when we're talking about these really large systems. Um, well, if messages are acknowledged, then there's this very simple way that we can handle uh, failed, failed components. We handle it in the exact same way that we handle the, the sort of the edges of the, of the um, system. You know, if, if, there's, if there's nobody to hand something to, just reverse the velocities of the particles. And so then we sort of get fault tolerance you know, as an emergent property without actually speci specifying this. You know. You'll see how it looks like. It looks like this. These five, these five uh, patches are dead patches. So yeah, you know, it's not perfect. We get you know, a certain amount of things getting stuck here, but it's a very simple system. Um, now, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not the one who came up with a concept of spatial computing. There's lots of applications, um, lots of different domains. Uh, I would, you know, if you're curious, I would recommend looking up the literature. Um, you know, particle systems are really just sort of one, one possible way to do spatial computation. Uh, you know, there's abstract particle systems which do uh, sort of very interesting, uh, sort of from a theoretical point of view, do, do uh, very interesting computations like SAT solvers. So, um, this is a, uh, a topological simulation of a more <coughs> Type of process where you have like a reaction diffusion system on a, on a torus here. These are just, um, you know, this is a simulation of like sensor modes calculating the you know, nearest neighborhood sort of thing. And this are sort of the physical instantiation of that is actual devices with little lights and talking to each other over here. Um, but in terms of sort of the takeaway here is that very large scale, I mean, sort of very scalable. Uh, parallel computer systems can be spatial computers if we sort of think of them in spatial terms and we program them in that way. And sort of the, the benefit for doing that is you not only get a cost model that approximates sort of the non-negotiable physical reality, but it also leverages our intuition about sort of how objects move around in the real world. Uh, so with that, um, I'm ready for questions if you have them. <laughs> Ah, okay, so that really depends on sort of the specific architecture of the computer. Um, for, I mean, you're, you're talking about real energy, right? Like the, um, so it's possible to do this, this style, I mean, the exact algorithm that I, I've done, because it's sort of reactive in the sense that nothing really has to happen unless there's particles sort of in a patch. Um, it can be done in, a, in an asynchronous style. And so you can actually turn the processor off while, it's, while there's no data to compute. So it can be very power efficient in that way. It doesn't have to be. It depends on sort of the machine you're using. Yeah? So I suspect that when you're computing the velocity of a particle based on its color, you're exploiting your knowledge of both the range and approximate distribution of the elements. And so in some sense, you're doing something very much like radix sorting, uh, except you're even using more assumptions because radix sorting doesn't really need to know the distribution. Well, how that, how that computation actually happens is I really have to be able to assign a value to each, to each particle, right? But I don't necessarily need to know any absolute range. I just need sort of a relative range. I need to know the, um, the difference between me as a particle and my overlapping particle neighbors. Uh, so I hope that helps. I'm not sure I quite understand. Yes. I mean, 
Yeah, because it, it only depends on the relative um, ordering of the data. So, um, Sorry, not a, not it's now time it. for a break. Why don't we say the break starts at... Teo, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Teo. We we'll have to take it, too. Sorry about that. No, never mind. I lost track. Oh, okay, thanks, Teo.